In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For those of you who don't know me at St. David's, along with being an Episcopal priest, I pay my bills as an economist. I am married to an amazing woman, Beth Altop. And we have three wonderful kids, two sons and a daughter, who is just uh, spending her first weekend now at the University of Michigan. As an economist, I had a colleague who once wrote a book that was a cost-benefit analysis about having children. His conclusion that children, all in all, have a negative net present value. In other words, children are not a wise investment. Of course, as a dad, I disagree. But I will admit, kids do not do much to enhance your retirement savings. The cost of college can be staggering, even at University of Michigan. And they reshape your life in ways you never thought possible before they were born. I joked when we were expecting our first son, Andrew, that I would present him at birth with a list of all the things he would never be given permission to do. Extreme skateboarding, bungee jumping, the list went on. And then he could say we never told him. Instead, a few hours after birth, he landed in the intensive care unit and the reality of being a parent became clear. If we love, we follow where the demands of parenting lead. Children often show the adults in their lives a new way of seeing the world. They take you places you never thought you would go. They see things with fresh eyes. It can be scary and you have to give up some control in your life. Through it all, good and bad, you realize that no economic book could ever count the riches found in giving yourself to another. You realize that in spite of your doubts and fears, in, in spite of the control you give away, following love makes it all worthwhile. This morning's gospel lesson pulls us into that lifelong struggle between control and following love. Jesus explains what his being the Messiah will entail, that he will suffer at the hands of the religious leader, he will die, and then on the third day he will be raised. This must have sounded like crazy talk. So Peter, who seems to have a bit of a sense of marketing, literally rebukes Jesus. God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. After all, who is going to sign up for Team Jesus or put a bumper sticker on their donkey or ox cart if this is going to be the outcome? Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. Your problem, Peter, is that your mind is set on human things and not on divine things. And that is a recipe for disaster. Jesus then explains to all of his disciples then and now, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Wow. This language about losing our life, is it really what we wanted to hear when we got up on a beautiful August morning to come to church? I cannot imagine what it must have been like to be Peter and the disciples in that moment and to hear these words. Poor Peter. In last week's gospel, he must have felt like he aced the exam when he correctly said who Jesus is. And now he feels like the class dunce 
As Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, Peter's ego must have been crushed. The words of Jesus this morning are painfully direct. It is hard to hear Peter's overconfident ego being put back in its proper place. But I think that was the point. Peter is thinking about what he wants, not what Jesus is called to do. To call Peter Satan is another way to say, Peter, you're tempting me to do the wrong thing. But more important than how Jesus addresses Peter is what he tells Peter to do. Get behind me. Get behind me. This is the true posture for a disciple, isn't it? We have to get behind Jesus because we can only follow him if we are behind. Then Jesus goes on to summarize discipleship in just two verses. Put aside your self-focus and follow with your cross. And if you go and try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life by following me, you will find it. As wild of a ride as this morning's passage is, as hard as it sounds, Jesus is really declaring to his disciples and to us good news. Like Peter, our challenge is that we want to follow our own plan, satisfy our own ego. But it's only when we get behind Jesus and follow that a new kind of living emerges. It's a bit like taking that first tough step into parenthood or marriage or other life-changing relationships. Your life isn't just your own anymore. Yet somehow, it is so much more than you could have envisioned. Looking at Peter this morning reminds me of what can truly make my life hard, and maybe the same is true for you. We get our own vision of things. We decide how the world can best serve us. We can fear being challenged to see things we didn't want to see before that aren't what we grew up believing. We fight to maintain the illusion that we are in control. In our fear and our fighting, we lose the very lives and possibilities that God has created us for. Worse, we can actively work to seize opportunities from others. We see this in our society today, built into the very fabric of our society and our, and our structures that maintain privilege and power for those who look like me. When politicians talk about those who would abolish suburbs, regardless of your political persuasion, we know that race is what's being discussed. When we see the shooting of Jacob Blake, the murder of George Floyd, the senseless death of Breonna Taylor, and contrast this with the welcome extended to armed vigilantes after a curfew, we are reminded that the value of persons in our society is too often determined by the color of their skin. These are manifestations of one group, consciously or unconsciously, placing its own agenda over the lives of others. We did not create the system that we were born into that devalues black lives while prioritizing others. There is a wonderful Mennonite saying about when you start to raise a child at least a hundred years before the child is born. This is because at least a hundred years before the child is born, the environment in which the child will be nurtured is being formed. But when we benefit from a society that produces racist outcomes, there is no point in asking if I participate in racism. How could I not? The question instead is, what am I going to do about racism? 
How am I going to get behind Jesus and follow? How will I allow following behind Jesus to change me, to recognize what is wrong, how it impacts others and myself, and then work for systematic changes, be it through voting, talking to my friends, reading, getting involved in a movement, you name it, so that there is not another Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Jacob Blake, and the list goes on. Whether we are talking about racism, poverty, or any other situation that erodes the dignity of others, getting behind Jesus isn't easy. Perhaps when I speak of my own experience, it resonates with you. I do not find it easy to let go of my self-created, usually narrow world and step into a much broader world that God has created for all. It means unlearning things, listening to those I haven't taken the time to get to know and listen to before, and knowing that I don't have all the answers and need to learn from others. This posture of following Jesus pushes us out of our comfort zones, and that is hard. It requires moving past what seems like a full life for a life that challenges us to live more deeply and in new ways. As much as this morning's passage might not be exactly what you wanted to hear on a beautiful morning like today, it invites us into a new way of living that is full of promise and of peace. There is a lot of freedom in realizing that we don't have to control everything, that we can let God's love set the agenda. While that path might not be easy, it offers a certain kind of peace. I think about the words of Dr. Martin Luther King in the speech that he made on his last night on earth. He spoke of how he had been to the mountaintop and seen the promised land. There is a peace in knowing that you have done the loving thing, the very best that you can. With Dr. King, we see that true leadership isn't born from our agenda, but from an inner peace and security born in following where Jesus leads. Dr. King could help a nation grow closer to its ideals because he was following behind Jesus he was going where God's love leads. We can help a nation grow closer to its ideals because we are following behind Jesus and we are going where God's love leads. I hope that this morning's gospel lesson actually creates some excitement about where we can go when we get behind Jesus we really can create change. We know we can make a difference. We can be one of those referenced at the end of this morning's gospel lesson who literally will not taste death before we see the kingdom of God's love breaking out around us. We experience our fullest lives when we put aside our own agendas and our own ones. We do this in our best moments as parents, as spouses, as friends, as children. Suddenly, we find we are doing things we never planned on and never knew we could do. We find we are fully who we have been created to be. We really do find God's kingdom in our midst. So too, giving up control and taking our place behind Jesus offers this same transformation, to go places you never thought you would, to see life with fresh eyes, to take risks, to give up control, to love those in your life more deeply. Through it all, in hard times and happy times, 
you realize that no economic study could ever count the riches found in getting behind and following, in giving up your life to find it. It is a challenge, but it is a life-giving journey that promises to keep us rooted in the love and peace of our gracious God. And for this we give thanks to God. Amen.